Okay, Erica. Whoa, whoops, did we lose Erica? I think we might have lost Erica. Yes, yeah, she's not there. No. Okay, I'll do I'll do a short introduction. Right, she's coming back on. Um, so um, welcome everybody. It's great to see you. There are 67, 68 people, 69 people here. Wow. Um, 70. Great. So it's great to see everyone. Um, and this is one of our intellectual shaman we shaman webinars. Um, and as any any of you have been on before know, um, you can use the chat box to po post questions for Stella. Um, or to share information with people if you want to. Um, and um, Erica and Michael will help <clears throat> help me. Um, I'm Sandra Waddick, by the way. Um, and Erica and Michael will help me to uh, sort of field questions. And what we'll do is have Stella talk. I'll interview her for about half an hour. Uh, first, I'll introduce her. And then, um, and then we'll um, uh, move to your questions. So um, hopefully everyone can hear and see. So uh, let me just introduce Stella. I'm so thrilled that you could do this, Stella. I, have, I met Stella when I was in South Africa about, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago now, probably. Yeah, um, been a while. Yeah, she's a professor in the Department of Human Resources Management at the University of Pretoria, actually now sort of retired, I guess. She claims she's retired, but she seems to be quite busy. Um, and president and founder of the uh, African Academy of Management. Um, through her work in uh, AFAM, uh, Stella has quite literally put African leadership and management issues on the map. Um, um, she recognized that Africa's growing economies and emerging markets were hotbeds of innovative leadership practices in dynamic and turbulent environments and knew the time was right for that kind of community. Um, Stella has a, a BS degree from Bryant College in Rhode Island um, and in the U.S., and she was born in New York. Right? Um, and obtained an MBA from the University of Rhode Island. Um, her PhD is from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and she's reached, she has held teaching positions in North Carolina, Rhode Island, South Africa. Um, she recently completed a term at Pretoria as Deputy Dean for Research and Postgraduate Studies in the Faculty of uh, Economic and Management Sciences, and was Associate Editor for the British Journal of Management and Organizations. Stella received the Academy of Management's 2018 Lifetime Achievement Award for Distinguished Service. Here's what was said about her by Professor Trish uh, Rie, who presented the award. Uh, the committee noted that Professor Nkomo's ongoing efforts to improve the quality of the university education and management research in Africa. Stella has been fully engaged in preparing for academy conferences in Africa. There was an, in, the first ever academy meeting outside of the US was held in Africa. Stella was instrumental in that, um, and taken an uh, instrumental role in the development of the Africa Journal of Management. Um, the broad impacts of her ongoing contributions in terms of service has brought lasting and now multiplying benefits to the field. Uh, so, um, for a little bit of background, Professor Nkomo's research places her as a thought leader um, in the areas of race, gender, power, and inequality. She's a noted scholar and consultant in areas of leadership and change, diversified workforces, and women in leadership. She's author of several books and re numerous refereed articles, including the acclaimed Our Separate Ways um, and, Courage and the other, uh, her other book, Courageous Conversations, a collection of interviews um, on reflections on responsible leadership. Um, so um, probably that's enough background. Um, she's clearly an influential thought leader. And um, it's just great to have you here, Stella, and to see you, and even if we have to do it virtually, which we'd be doing anyway, just so even without the coronavirus, we'd still be doing this virtually. virtually. Um, as you know, um, as I told you, the Intellectual Shamans webinar is meant to help faculty throughout their careers. And I suppose that right now, people are struggling to make sense of their careers, as we all face sequestering in the face of coronavirus. But to the point, mm -hmm. you've done so many things over the years. Perhaps. Um, it would be helpful if you can explain to uh, everyone um, what dynamics, relationships, relationships, and personal experience experiences shape you into the scholar that you are today. Um, okay, someone is sharing their screen. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Sa Sandra, thank you so much. Oops, hello. Hi, we're here. 
Okay. Uh, I just got an advertisement from Zoom telling me I should upgrade, but I'll ignore that. <laughs> um, uh, no, Sandra, thank you very much for that generous introduction. And to everyone on the call, it is a, it's an honor and a pleasure to spend this time with you. And I hope that I can add some value and make a contribution uh, to you in this conversation. Uh, Sandra, you know, uh, it, I'll try to give you the short answer of that question just to highlight the things that I think that have shaped me or led me to focus on what I want to focus on. So a lot of that has to do with, you know, one's life story. And we don't have time this afternoon to tell my entire life story. So I think about possibly three, three episodes. One was that I... Um, I grew up in New York City, although I was born in Georgia. My parents were not very well educated. They had left the American South, as many African Americans did so in the 1940s, and came to New York. They left us at, in Georgia with my grandparents, and we came to New York, and they uh, ended up getting very menial positions. My mother could not work because she had so many children. So we grew up in New York City in, in very poor neighborhoods. And when I, got to, when I got to high school, it was at the time of busing. And so we, children living in the poor Hispanic and black neighborhoods, we were bused to a middle-class white school. And that was probably at a time when I realized uh, that the world is quite unequal in the sense that it was a time when New York City had tracks for, for, for high school students. And so I was placed on what they call the commercial track. And I was told, frankly, by my counselor, when I said I wanted to go to college, he said, you're too poor to go to college. So you have to get a practical skill. <clears throat> so I started, I, I learned shorthand and typing. And, and, and that allowed me to get my first job in business. And what I noticed in my first job, which was working for a large commercial bank in downtown Manhattan, that all of the women were either tellers or secretaries. And these young interns would come in and they were mostly white men and they would come in fresh from college and then they would come in and they would boss everyone around. So that was my first glimpse into what is with this? I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see any women coming in as interns. And I remember asking my boss, I said, how can I do what they do? And he said, Stella, you need to get a college degree. So I started going to school at night. And I thought at that time, I wanted to be like them. And so I got my first degree. And then I went on to, to do my MBA. But by the time I got to, to my MBA, I started having second thoughts because in my MBA class, it was also, also mostly men and no women. And I thought, there's a pattern going on here that I think something needs to be done about. And so I decided then that I thought one way I could make an impact was through education, teaching. And so I decided then to pursue a PhD. At the time, and maybe like some early career folks, I don't know, but I didn't have a great, a clear idea that, you know, getting a PhD was also about research. I was probably motivated more by the teaching. But when I got to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and they asked me what I wanted to research, my instinct was, I want, to, I want to look at race and gender. And I was told bluntly, you can't study that. It's not an important topic. And so if you want to get your PhD, you listen to what you're told. So I did not study race and gender for my PhD because I wanted to get my PhD. So it was only after I got my PhD and I got my first job that I got clarity about what I really wanted to do. And I said, now that I have a PhD, I'm gonna study what I really want to study. 
which is race and gender in organizations and why people, some people, are not able to have full status in organizations. So that's kind of like the short version of how I got really focused on teaching and writing about and being really concerned about how do I help people who don't fit into the so-called normative expectations or uh, what is the dominant models? How can I, through my teaching and my research, try to do something about that? So that's kind of the short, quick version, Sandra, of what informed my uh, life and my, my journey. And I think the other thing, I mean, there's many other experiences too, you know, being involved in early on in the civil rights movement in the USA, being exposed to black power at the University of Massachusetts, we formed a third world women's group trying to look at issues of third world women. And then when I married my husband who was from South Africa, I was heavily involved in the anti-apartheid movement in the USA. But all of that just comes together around what I still believe for me is the most important contribution that I can make as a scholar and a teacher is to deal with issues of inequality and marginalization and how we can make the world better by really focusing in those, on those issues and, and making change happen. Sorry for such a long answer. Oh no, that's, that's great. Um, I, I know that <laughs> but, you know, one of the things I know, I know is that you, you did move from uh, the United States to South Africa. Could you talk a little bit about that? So that, because that's a huge, um, Shifting. Yeah, and you know, well, other than yeah, marrying yeah. your husband, <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was great because um, you know at the time it was a, a quite a quite a challenge because uh, you know, 1994 Mandela got out of prison. There was a lot of hope, and my husband, of course, wanted to go home immediately. And so when I moved here, it's been 20 years. When I moved here, what was actually the most frightening thing, and it may sound naive to folks, but I thought, boy, I'm moving to South Africa. What in the world can I offer to my students in South Africa and to the country, given that I'm basically coming from a developed country, coming from the North? So I was quite anxious about about the teaching aspect. And when I got here and I started teaching my leadership class only to find that they were using exactly the same materials that I had been using in the USA. But teaching students in a new country that was just coming out of 50 years of longer history, but 50 years of segregation, racial segregation and apartheid that quickly woke me up. You know, I had students in my class who were in government in the front line of trying to build a democratic nation. You know, I remember one of my first classes, a student raised his hand. I was talking about leading change and a student raised his hand and he said, Professor, I'm the, I'm the director general for <clears throat> the Department of Health. And I've been asked to come up with a strategy for addressing HIV AIDS in the country. So how can you help me? <laughs> and, and that's a true story. And I thought, I have never, you don't get those kind of questions. And typically, I had not had those kind of questions teaching at the University of North Carolina. So the, so the issues were very real, very dynamic. They were not theoretical. They were right available and, and the students were looking for for things that could help them to immediately begin to change the country. So there was a challenge of trying to figure out my teaching content, my teaching materials. There were very few materials that had relevant materials for, for, for South Africa or people in Africa. So one challenge was pedagogy and materials. <laughs> The other challenge was, for my knowledge, me beginning to understand what 
was going on on the ground. So I spent a lot of time with my students and also luckily because the country needed uh, contributions, I had a chance, although I'd only been here for a couple of years, I had a chance to work with President Mbeki in his office on the status of women looking at gender mainstreaming and gender transformation. Uh, on a personal level, it was also part of learning uh, the culture and the how to be a person in a culture that's quite different from the USA. And uh, as, as, as kind of a lighter matter, learning how to drive on the left-hand side of the road. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, but the, real, the, real, the real challenge was really trying to um, to be open and to set aside deep assumptions and, and, and ways of operating in the U.S. and trying to really be part of a culture here and part of a system here and to make a contribution that would be worthwhile. So, so that notion of setting aside deep assumptions that you just uh, mentioned, that's, I think, important in any research that we do because we come in, uh, it helps, it would help us to get rid of whatever biases. Oh, yeah. In. So how, how do you go about doing that? Well, it's not easy because you, it's not easy. So it, it's not easy. I mean, we talk about emic research all the time, right? But, but it's amazing how deep the imprints are in our discourse, in our thinking, in our way that we frame things. And so, for example, I'll give you an example now. So when the shutdown for coronavirus was announced in South Africa, you know, the first issue that comes to mind is how do you get a society where people are quite collectivist? People think of themselves as, as groups. They don't think of I or me. So how are you going to get people who are collectivists to now say you must isolate, you must stand six feet from people, you must not go visit your neighbors? So the government has made some adjustments to say, you know, people can still have funerals. They can have 50 people there. So I think the same thing for me. I, 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 would allow, I had to allow my students to help me. But it was also throwing out, I threw out everything that I had taught or used to teach in the US and I started building my materials from scratch. I went out and I did a major research project and I started talking to the leaders of companies in South Africa who were in the process of transforming their companies to learn how they were thinking about it, what they thought the issues were. I started reading a lot of material about uh, Africa, you know, post-colonial work, African history. So I had to educate myself, but the most important thing I would tell people is you have to learn from the people you're working with and, and, and listening uh, carefully and co-constructing. Co so I had my students often involved in co-constructing the learning materials. Mm. I hope that makes sense to you, but I, I couldn't just give you a formula. It's really about being very sensitive and very aware of how much we are often embedded in a particular way of thinking. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, for any scholar, it's really important to understand that your perspective is not the same perspective as people that you might be working with. And so this, I love this idea of co-evolving uh, co teaching materials and presumably research too. So could you talk a little bit how, about how your research shifted and uh, what you were doing in the yeah. US and then how that shifted when you moved to South Africa? Yeah, so I, I, I realized too that my research now had to be Africa-centered. So that meant, for example, I'll just give you a quick example. Like in the U.S., I have been doing diversity work and equal opportunity. Well, those concepts are not really applicable here. I got here and people were talking about transformation. 
and transformation of the workplace. So that was important to understand. So what does that mean? So it was not simply um, diversity training. It was sort of like, how do we create these new structures that changes deeply the structure of organizations? How do we now change the balance of society? So for example, here in South Africa, they have something called Black Economic Empowerment. Some of you may have heard of that. And that is trying to change the ownership of companies, to change the presence of Black people in the management of companies. Mm -hmm. So it was, so it, it was a, just a totally different thing. So for example, it's not meant a, a matter of accommodation or just including people. How do you create organizations that are non-racial, non-sexist in, in the sense. So it, it was a totally different way of thinking about a, a system in the, in the US where you were basically thinking about helping people to fit in. It was about changing the shape of organizations. I mean, it's still a lot of work to be done, but the concept was quite different and, and quite bolder and how do you create something new from not, it was not simply like, you know, as some people like to say, it wasn't really de, de apartizing <laughs> It was, how do you create this new, this new concept, this new entity, this new type of society? And so that is an ongoing challenge. I would not say that I have figured that out. And so my research became much more Africa centered. And that's what led me to being involved with the Africa Academy of Management. Because I realized too, I'm coming as an American. Uh, and so if, if, if knowledge creation and research is going to be African centered, then it must be led by African scholars. It doesn't mean I don't have a role to play. And given the fact that in Africa, Mm -hmm. uh, for historical reasons, we, we were basically left out of knowledge creation. Before colonialism, Africa was producing knowledge and a lot of knowledge, but you know, colonialism disrupted, disrupted knowledge production. It also mar marginalized any knowledge coming from Africa. And so at the, like in South Africa, there were very few black academics only they were only allowed to, they were only working primarily in the historically black colleges so one of the needs was to help young african academics to pursue phd's and then to become the intellectual leaders in their countries in the countries that they were in so that's part of the work that i've been doing at afam helping young african academics to pursue a phd and to support them to become great researchers from an African-centered perspective. Yeah, I remember when I was in South Africa meeting a lot of young PhD students, some not so young actually, um, and being just astounded at um, the kinds of work that they were doing, which had uh, much more of this sort of transformative impact that you're just talking about. Yeah. Um, so they're not just looking at, uh, you know, our theories and saying, oh, let me just pick out this little gap in the literature. They're actually out there in the world doing something. And, and when they do get, grapple with a PhD, but you may want to talk a little bit about the PhD getting process there and what some of the issues with that as well. But they're out there in the world doing stuff that needs to be done. And that's what their PhDs uh, focus on. So could you talk a little bit about the PhD, sort of PhD land and in Africa, and how that differs from the U.S.? Well, typically, uh, it, it's a structure of, uh, it's, you might call it apprentice model, where it's a supervisor working with a student. And so there's no classroom-based seminars, or it's not a classroom-based uh, PhD like in the U.S. where I attended. Uh, so when I got here, that was an odd structure for me. I wasn't familiar with that structure. But what occurred to me is that it, it was not going to work because of the history of education for African students. 
but also the need to bring them together to discuss the issue of how do I become a scholar and how do I make sure I build knowledge for Africa that will deal with those issues. And so the other challenge there was that, um, you know, the, the system of finding a supervisor was quite competitive. And so you had to appear with a proposal. You already had to have a proposal done. You had to convince a supervisor to take you on. And then you were, you know, given minimal guidance and told to come back and defend your proposal. So the system really was one that was not going to produce a large number of African academics in, in the time that is needed. And so one of the things that we have done uh, is try to support that. Uh, the funding model is based on that model, so it's very difficult to to change this system, which was actually inherited from colonialism. But some of us have tried to come up with innovative ways to provide a seminar-based education. Like at the University of Pretoria now, we put together a program where we do bring the students together uh, for workshops and for seminars. Uh, through the Africa Academy of Management, we hold workshops throughout the continent to bring African students together to talk about uh, their research or to give them support in completing their doctorates. Um, I'm hoping that the, the system will totally change to, to a more traditional type of uh, classroom-based uh, PhD structure. But, but for now, I think that uh, because of the funding model, uh, South Africa continues primarily to be the, the old apprenticeship model. And I think it needs to change uh, if they want to. The government has set a goal of producing 5,000 PhDs a year by 2030. Right now, the country is producing about 1,500 PhDs a year, and they'd like to get that up to 5,000 mm -hmm. by 2030. So, um, yeah, um, you, you founded a journal called the Africa Journal of Management, you alluded to a few minutes ago. Um, um, and this PhD model that you're mentioning is very, very similar to what's found in many European and uh, other nations around the world, um, different from what we do in the United States, um, and, and sort of put students out there on their own. Um, and, and I think there's some link between people not trained in sort of a, uh, we call it the US model for lack of a better term, and um, the types of work that they're doing and what can get published in say um, an academy management journal versus um, what is needed in say a country uh, like South Africa uh, in terms of the kind of research that's being done. And, um, so can you talk a little bit about the rationale for founding the journal and what you hope to accomplish with it? Well, we, yeah, we, you know, people said don't start a journal, you know, you get that advice. And I think with the Africa Journal of Management, we're very fortunate to be led by the editor Moses Kakundu, who has done a great job. I think our goal was to, to give a, an outlet, a voice uh, for research devoted on management issues in Africa. Uh, a place where people could publish the research where they would not have to deal with the question that they would normally get if they sent their articles to more traditional journals, for example. I mean, I, interestingly, I got this, which I thought was strange when, <laughs> when I relocated here. Uh, why, why do you, why, well, th this is too specific on Africa or we're not sure if our readership would be interested in this topic because it's very African or very South African. Um, so one of the, the things of our journal is that you don't have to deal with that question. We want research on management topics in Africa, about Africa, relevant for Africa. And we're very interested in issues that are, that are current, not necessarily esoteric, not about you know uh, creating a model with 15 variables 
not that it should not be good research, but the questions have to be dealing with real issues, real time issues, the issues that would help the continent to advance in terms of management. We also have what we call a, a sections that are focused on practitioner issues. So we want the journal to be accessible. We want it to be read. So I think the key is that we wanted a journal that would be a collective. It would allow us to bring together a, a, a body of knowledge about management in Africa. And we're very happy and we thank all of the people who have uh, contributed articles because the journal is doing quite well. And we make the journal available to our members. Uh, we're still trying to get it into libraries, but I do think it has become an important source uh, for current issues of management in Africa. Thank you. I'm going to um, I'm going to remind people that if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box and try to pick up as many of them as we possibly can, although possibly not all of them. Um, Anne Sui, um, um, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Because it's the question I was about to ask. So, um, oh. uh, so Anne, can you do that? There you go. Yeah. Thank you, Stella, so much for sharing with us your life story. It's very moving. Thank you, Anne. Um, the quite, I actually have two questions. The first question um, is about how change came about in Africa. What you describe being uh, 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 the ideal transformation at a societal level, at an organization level, and, and uh, not using the word gender and race, just kind of more broad-based transformation, including those this is really yeah. very encouraging. So, so, so as I think about in the U.S., most of these changes that we desperately need, whether it's race issues, the gender issues, very much came yes. from the bottom up. There's been nothing happening yes. in the government level. So, so I'm curious about in, Af yeah. in South Africa, where does change come from? Is it from enlightened leadership in the top? Or is it coming from the grassroots movement? Um, that's, a great, that's a great question, Anne. Thank you. You know what? See, that's what's interesting to me, because in South Africa, you have both happening. So clearly, the government has set a very clear agenda about transformation, equality, structures. So that issue, you don't have to fight here because the government wants to achieve that. And then from the bottom, we have a lot of people working in NGOs, individuals working so I think this is why I'm hopeful, because it's coming from the top and also from yeah. the bottom. And I'm glad you brought that up because I should have mentioned that earlier. That That's was great. one of the most striking things for me when I came here. Yeah. You know, in, in, the, in the U.S. when I was doing diversity work, and if you think about the civil rights movement in the U.S., you know, you were fighting the government. <laughs> we were fighting the government, trying to get the government to see right. that these issues were important. And so you come to South Africa after apartheid and the government, yes, the government is driving this agenda. It's in the constitution. It's in structures. And so, the, the, but it doesn't, and then you have people on the ground working on it. I think with the both forces, that's why I'm optimistic. It doesn't, it doesn't make the change, the, the enormity of the change any easier. Right. Because these structures of inequality are deep. Mm -hmm. They're deep into, into systems. So if you think about, like one of the case studies I did, just to give you an example, which was part of my education, I, I talked to the, the, per, the first black CEO of the telecommunications company in 2001. And he was the first black CEO of this, tele, of this company. And he was charged with transforming the telephone company, telecommunications. And he said, Stella, you know, the telephone system in South Africa had been built to only serve the white population, three million people and everybody else was excluded. So now how do you build a telephone system <laughs> that will now incorporate everybody? So this meant literally that the telephone lines 
were only built to the white neighborhoods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, like I said, the university systems, there weren't enough universities mm -hmm. to accommodate the majority population. So it was literally trying to build all of that and that. And so you need people from the, from the bottom and mm -hmm. people from the top, but the task it, it, you know, it's been 27, close to 27 years. The task still remains a huge challenge. Uh, but thank you, Anne, you're right. So that, it, it, yeah, the challenge. But remember too, I think what I would say clearly, the, uh, the ending of apartheid was driven a great deal by everyday people, you know. And so that energy in South Africa is still there. People are very much uh, willing to protest and to fight <laughs> for what they believe should be theirs, and I think that's a good that's spirit. Good. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's an that's an interesting um, notion because in this coronavirus crisis, we're seeing the flaws in our, our all of our systems in so many countries. Um, and is uh, I see Steve Waddell is on here, and uh, he wrote a blog yesterday about. Um, um, taking this opportunity to transform systems. And that's got to come from the yes. bottom up, the top down and laterally, so. That's great, thank well, you, you know, I, Thank you, Anne. Well, you know, I don't know, I, I, I hope, you know, teaching leadership, I hope one of the things that will come out of coronavirus, no matter what happens, is that it will, it will reveal clearly to people, even those who, don't believe it's a problem, the deep social fault lines and the, in the inadequacies in so many of our systems. And, and maybe this will be a wake up call that these things need to be fixed. So I, I'm hoping. One can only that, speak of hope. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know how one, you know, it's one thing to kind of say inequality is not a problem. But this is revealing. Uh, I mean, Absolutely. you know, as, as the South Africans were saying on the talk shows this morning, look at what's happening in America. And we know our health our healthcare system is nowhere near America. So if America can't handle this, what, what do we forecast for ourselves? So I, I'm hoping that the developed countries see that there's problems. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to get to Anne's other question, but Romina, are you still here? Can you unmute yourself and ask your question about invisibility? Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, Sandra. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, Dr. Nkomo, thank you for this talk. Um, I guess my you question... Call me, you can call me Stella, Romina. Hello, Stella. Stella. <laughs> I have I'm been... Stella. I've been following your work for a long time uh, as a PhD student and, and even now, and I really uh, thank you for being here. I've got a quick question for you. One of the things that I'm looking at is um, the, the challenges and barriers for women of color in senior mm. management positions in Canadian organizations. And one, one challenge that I have is um, that the, the access to people who are actually in the top management positions because there aren't okay. many. And the second yes. is how do you, so the invisibility of being a visible minority, because mm. oftentimes people don't see you uh, or don't see your potential, and how do you break free of that? So those are kind of my two things I'm struggling with. Wow. Any insight okay, so, yeah, I don't know how I can be helpful in the first one. So, you know, um, you know what you have to do, and, and Ella, Bell, and I, when we did our separate ways, we, well, we had a problem, too, because we wanted to talk to senior women. Our problem is we went to the companies first, and we thought we had to access through the companies, and when they heard what we were doing, they got a little bit frightened, worried that we were going to reveal discrimination and whatnot, and we got very, very alarmed that we weren't going to find a, a women to talk to. Then it dawned on us that we didn't need the companies. Let's just find the women. So I would say to you, I think you have to kind of think about, are there any networks, uh, snowballing, if you find a couple of women and, and try to talk to them about what you're doing, 
they may introduce you to other people so that you build your sample over time. I don't know if that's helpful to you. Um, and the thing about, oh, this thing about being visible. Well, I think it's like a two, it's like a, it's like a vice, you know, that, um, it's, it's a vice because on one hand, you can be uh, invisible, right? On the other hand, you can be too visible. So for example, if you are one of a few and you're in a situation where people want to prove that they are uh, uh, fair and they're positive, they often use you as an example. I think that what I found in my own career is part of it is to be willing to, to get, I don't call it visibility, more to have impact, is that one has to be, have the courage to, to speak up. And that is why, as I told you, when I was a doctoral student, I didn't, I didn't have the courage to say, I wanna study uh, race and gender organizations and I'm gonna do it no matter what. I mean, I didn't have any power to do that and I thought, let me get my PhD. But I did know one thing, that as soon as I got the PhD, I was gonna go back to that topic. And and I remember people telling me, stay away from race because you won't get tenure, you won't get promotion. And I just ignored that. I decided, no, this is what I'm really interested in and I'm gonna research it and I'm gonna do it well. And in the end that paid off. So what I would say to you, the way to get visibility is to really focus on doing the work that you want to do and do it well. And I do think then other people will join. Other people are also interested in those topics. And so, yes, I, yeah, I, I think if one tries to take the safe path, that one could remain invisible, if I understand your question. I think having the courage to speak out is a way to not just get visibility for yourself, but to make the issue you're working on visible. Does that help, Romina? That's absolutely perfect. Thank you so very much for the time. And, for and the I'll time. tell you the other thing I would say to you as a young scholar, find your community. There are other people who are also interested in what you're doing or what you're doing. And I found, you know, finding people like Ella Bell, finding, finding Taylor Cox, just as the association is working, finding other people who also have this interest that the power of collectivism and, and working together to keep up your motivation. And, and, and I think one voice becomes a chorus. And so I would say, don't try to do the work by yourself. Okay. Try to work with others. That, so that idea of finding your passion and doing what you have to do because it's almost a calling, it is a calling, um, as you express it, is characteristic of all of the intellectual challenges that I study, um, that they were just driven to do the work they had to do. And it really, it's not that it didn't matter what other people thought, but it matters a lot less than doing the work that's important and taking the risks and the consequences of being, which is what you just expressed. Um, and um, Steve Waddell, do you want to um, ask your question about Black Swans? I think um, that she actually answered it, Estella, thank you. Um, it was about Hello, uh, just, <laughs> just uh, in this time of a Black Swan crisis of, <clears throat> that we're all facing, um, the particular opportunity uh, that you might see emerging in this, and you referred to uh, making apparent um, the division uh, of services and access uh, that is so much part of <laughs> the systems, um, certainly that you're talking about, but of course, anywhere. Um, and so I was wondering from your deep change experience, um, whether you have any sort of thoughts about how we can take, care, uh, take advantage of that 
um, so that we can help thrust it into the limelight and do something with it um, so that we don't w waste this crisis and we can actually, maybe people on this call are interested in collectively doing yeah. something uh, even. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Steve. I was thinking, you know, of course we're academics, so I would think how could we use it in our teaching to make those lessons very visible? How could we maybe writing writing about it, uh, you know, and, and to reveal to people uh, what will come out over time is probably the differential differential impact that the virus has had on different communities and different groups in different parts of the world, right? And I hope that people will see that, as people have been saying here, the virus knows no borders. The virus doesn't know who you are, <laughs> particularly. And, and, and to show people that my humanity is tied up with your humanity. You know, uh, even if I'm safe and I have world-class health care, I may not be able to get that because the hospital I have to go to is under so much stress that it cannot come to me. So I think part of this is maybe trying to come together and writing about this and thinking about how can we make it underscore how we're all in, all, all of us are in this together, that no one is immune from being affected by COVID-19. Some will be affected more than others, but this is affecting the whole world. And maybe it will help us to be in touch with our humanity. I think that's the potential opportunity in this that we figure out that we are all connected. And surely if the virus shows us nothing else, it's that we're in one world. Um, Joseph Lukunzi, uh, would you like to ask your question? Uh, oh, Joseph. You have to unmute yourself. Stella, how are you? Good, Joseph. How are you, fellow South African um, here? I'm good, Stella. It's good to see you. Yes. Yes, I just want to ask uh, how have you, uh, what is your take on the current uh, diversity question in South Africa and the transformation agenda post 1994, given the fact that since 1994, the government has still been struggling to balance diversity yeah. on the one hand and transformation on the other. Yeah, it's still, as I said to people early, that was one of the things I said, there's still a long way to go. There's been some progress, but not enough, especially in terms of the intersection of with, with, with class. So a lot of the transformation efforts have been focused on, you know, changing the faces of people at the top. But more needs to be done of making sure it goes to all levels of society. I think that greater progress has been made in government structures than in the private sector. But clearly, if you look at it, I remember when I first came, Joseph, in 2001, looking at the first employment equity figures, like top management must have been like 90% white males. That is counted down to 67%. I think the other remaining challenge is economic economic transformation in terms of wealth distribution. Big companies, the basic wealth structure is still in the hands of, of, the major, of, of whites, and that will have to change. Black economic empowerment still has a long way to go. Uh, increasing the number of uh, businesses owned by blacks and women so yes, so there's been change, but the ch pace of change has to accelerate uh, in the coming years. The pace of uh, has to change. Um, I think what's interesting in South Africa, when I was coming, I thought there would be, you know, South Africa is a society where there's a lot of harmony in the sense that people basically get along okay every day but the truly embracing the concept of a non-racial society uh, and what that means on a day-to-day -day basis, I think there's still more work to be done on that at a deep level. You know, more than just replacing people. It's not replacing 
you know, black people with white people. It's clearly believing in racial equality and gender equality at a very deep level in terms of what the society should be. So the short answer is we've made some progress, but I think there's still a great deal to be done, especially in terms of economic inequality and the level of poverty that we face in the country. These are these are huge issues of sort of mindset and shifting mindset, which is as we know, Donella Meadows says is the most powerful change lever. Um, so I guess I have a question. How do you go about um, thinking about that kind of huge mindset change so that you can, especially among people who have power, who are benefiting from the current Ooh. system? Yeah, I think, I don't know, Sandra, if anybody can figure out that one, because you see, you know, to the extent that those who are in the dominant group benefit, you have to, they have to be willing, or if not willing, which is what South Africa has tried to do through the Constitution and the laws to say, you will share, you will not control. You know, and so one thing can be through laws and legislation, but clearly that's not enough. So part of it is trying to get people themselves that how, how can I give up or how can I be part of the solution and letting go of the privileges that I have? And so that is the next stage of change, is how do we get dominant groups, whether it be patriarchy or, or heterosexism or you know, racism, is to understand that those structures requires me to fundamentally change. Mm -hmm. It's not out there, I'm part of it and I am making it work every day. And, 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 and the good thing is I do think, you know, in South Africa, it's not a monolithic thing. I can't say all whites are like that because there are people who are, who are willing to be contributors and make the change. We just need to accelerate that. So this is what I've been trying to focus on and I don't have the answer. I, you know, I've been reading again, Personally, I've been reading uh, Pablo Ferre who, and, and, and the pedagogy of the oppressed. And some people are talking about the pedagogy of the oppressor. What is the educational uh, intervention for those who, who are in dominant groups? How do we help them to come to a consciousness about why it would be beneficial for them to no longer be part of the oppression. And I don't have an answer to that. I think this is where we should be. I mean, I personally said to people, you know, in, in my work on diversity, I'm tired of writing critical pieces. <laughs> I think we, we write a lot of critical articles, those of us who take a critical perspective, but the answer, the question now is what, what's, what, what should, how do we solve inequality? What are the interventions we can use to deal with? What, what are the solutions? Not that I like that word, but how do we begin to unravel inequality? I, I, in, in my heart and in my intellectual capacity, I do believe that we created these systems. We created these fault lines. We created inequality. I believe we can undo it. So how do we get the willpower to want to undo it as hard as it might be? Right, thanks, Stella. Um, I just want to point out that in the chat box, David Wasleski put in a note for PhD students about the PhD networks that uh, the International Humanistic Management Association is organizing that David um, is in charge of. So if there are PhD students here who want a network of like-minded people who can look at that. Um, Oscar Holmes, you had a question related to the Academy. Are you still here? Oh, Oscar. Yes. Hey, Oscar. 
How are you? How are you? Thanks Very for good. listening in. Of course, it's excellent. So I have a quick question. Um, as, as many of us may know, the academy management has been relatively off on a lot of these societal issues. So I would like to know, in your opinion, what do you think the academy should do when it comes to the systemic issues of oppression discrimination? I'm, I'm going to go back for a minute because my son is here with me. <laughs> Well, academy of management, you know, I think I think it's two things. Academy of management has to start with itself. <laughs> the academy of management, I think, has come has has improved. You know, uh, I was on the board of governors for two terms, and I think the academy of management has to be first of itself, looking at itself. How can the academy of management be truly in a more of inclusive, and a more global organization? I think it's still too U.S. centric frankly, still too U.S. centric, although they want to be part of the other world, the rest of the world. So one thing is looking inside. And the other part is to be much more, you know, for example, we, we need to look at real issues that are affecting the world. And, to, and I think the Academy is trying to do that by having conferences in the rest of the world. But I think we have to look at the academy in terms of what still gets rewarded. Uh, how can the academy do more in terms of influencing the member institutions? How does it reach out for, you know, the kinds of issues of inequality that are going on in business schools and management schools? How can the academy be much more vocal in terms of the tyranny? <laughs> The tyranny of what counts as top research, you know? We, we talk a good game, but we don't always want to let go of the conventions <laughs> of, you know, the, these are the only outlets, these are the top journals. So again, as I said earlier, part of the problem is that we do things to reinforce the very things we say we want to change. So, yeah, I think that, as I said, when I came to South Africa, it, it meant that I needed to look into, look at Stella and to say, who am I? Where am I coming from? What's my positionality? What do I need to do if I'm going to be a contribution here? So I think the Academy has to also step up. And, and our journals, I mean, you know, you, you pick up, you pick up issues and you wouldn't know that there's other things really happening out there in the world. They're not, they're not in our journals or, or people are reluctant to write about them. Or you can't get, or you can't even find it. What, what irritates me is you go to one of these journals and want to submit a paper. And I've been working on transformations for the last few years. And actually since I first came to South Africa, because that's when it's, Steve Waddell was on this call. Um, yes. Started the, the interest, the group of us being interested in that. Um, and you can't find the keywords. I mean, if you're not in some, what do they call a line of conversation that's already going on, yeah. forget it. You can't get the paper. You can't even submit it because there's nothing relevant. Well, yeah, you're right, Sandra. And so that whole thing, I mean, this is one of the things we've been talking about in, in when we do the Africa Academy of Workshops, and, and, and the journals expect that you must show the little gap, the yeah. gap, the incremental gap. So that means you have to repeat what the current conversation is. So how do you start from an indigenous basis where you really don't want that conversation or that conversation hasn't really applied? Right to your situation and what you're interested in. So the feedback you're going to get is that you're not anchored in the current conversation. So as I was saying, I think part of the problem, our challenge of wanting to change as scholars, because everybody, there's a lot of articles written about, you know, why isn't our research relevant? Every time a president of the Academy of Management speaks, people bring up this issue of relevance, but then we keep on doing, doing the same things. <laughs> Say always, we. We keep, oh, on, we, keep on, we keep on. We keep on. We keep on. We keep on doing the same things, and so we stay exactly where we are, although we want something else. Right. That's Einstein's 
great observation. You can't change true. things from the same level of thought that, that created the problem in the first place. Well, and we've reached the end of our hour, and thank, uh, I wanted to thank everybody for staying on. Uh, there were well over 100 people here still, and I don't know if you noticed that. Um, well, I'm really honored. <laughs> and um, and um, thank you all for listening, and um, hopefully uh, there's another, actually another email call at noon with Michael Gelb on creativity, so some of you might be interested in that as well. Noon Boston time, I think mean, we're all of you are. Um, and um, I want to thank you, Stella. This was terrific. I mean, just such great insights and such um, such a broad perspective. And being able to come from two very different parts of the world, I think, really gives us insights that we can't normally get. So I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, and thank everybody. Michael or Erica, do you have any final comments? Just a quick thanks to everyone. We're so pleased you're all here. Again, this is an initiative of the International Humanistic Management Association. Huge thanks to Stella and Sandra for this very important discussion this morning, very timely. Um, uh, we have many other events. We've put the website in the chat. Um, we have one coming up at noon, as Sandra mentioned. Michael, I don't know if you want to chime in quickly, but just so pleased to be connected with all of you for this important work. Yes, thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy. Okay. And thank you all. Thank, thank you, Sandra. You all.